Sparky is a great dog, a great friend. The best dog a kid could have. When you lose someone you love, they never really leave you. He'll always be in your heart. I don't want him in my heart. I want him here with me. The nervous system is just wires and cables. Even after death, the muscles respond to electricity. <laughs> Tim's instinct was to do um, all the stuff that we'd done in Frank and Winnie, so, you know, the, the boy and his dog story, but then he had a list of these other monsters he wanted to see, and his the thought was that the other boys in the class might see the inspiration of, of Victor bringing back Sparky and create their own monsters, and, and they have I would unleash, and uh, that was a great idea. So my job was to find a reason why this was all happening and a framework for it. So um, I pitched this, you know, the new science teacher, the science fair, I pitched New Holland, which is like a reason why there's a giant windmill in this suburban town, and putting together all those pieces so that we actually had a, a larger story um, that was really sustained for the two hours. The also luxury of a feature length version is we had more time with Victor and Sparky before the accident. You could really sort of settle with that. We needed to be very true to the story of a boy and his dog. That's the emotional core of the movie. And what's so great about a boy and his dog is that it's so simple that we, when we go off to the flights of fantasy with Weird Girl and, you know, uh, all the other experiments that are happening, um, we can always come back to it's about a boy and his dog, and they were always going to be sort of the emotional core of the movie. I knew that this story was really personal to Tim, and not only was it sort of the story of you know him and his dog, and sort of you know that first losing that first dog in your life, um, but it was also his one of his first um, live action features, and so a lot of things we associate as being Burton-esque in terms of movie making um, sort of fi found their origins there. So I knew it was personal for a lot of reasons. But it was also very universal. Like I had a you know a fourteen year old dog at that time who I knew I was going to be losing soon, who was mm -hmm. my Sparky, and so um, I have a young daughter, and so I needed to find those words to talk to my young daughter about you know Jake dying. So uh, there was a lot going on. That it was very much Tim's story, but there was a lot of my story there. And I think because it's so universal, it can apply to um, everyone who loves a dog. My work experience with Tim has been that Tim will give you. Um, the, the brief of like, this is what I want to do, and then he'll send you off and you'll do what you know you can do to, to create that movie for him. And so, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was a 15 minute conversation. Um, Corpse Bride was, it's this, but we need to do this, and, and, and me pitching back sort of what needed to happen. So, I think if I hadn't done those other movies with him, I would be paranoid about sort of like, you know, trying to make everything be Burton esque in sort of a crazy way. And uh, you recognize that you're trying to create a world that feels real and consistent and let Tim's vision come in and sort of let him do the, the Burton-esque things. So I'm creating elements like Weird Girl, who has a, um, a cat who can poop the future, um, <laughs> but how it's all going to fit and feel, that's going to be Tim. Okay. The story of Frank and Winnie uses elements of the Frankenstein story, but in a very broad sense, in the sense of like the Promethean myth of like you're bringing something to life that was previously dead. Um, so we're using some of the tropes of that, but we're not trying to stay especially true to uh, that one story. Um, this was a chance to sort of like look at the, all the other monster movie tropes and sort of how the other uh, boys create their monsters and who are those archetypes of those boys and what are the archetypes of those monsters and how those would come into the world. You know, we know we needed an angry mob at the end. You, right. need, you need the villagers. You need the windmill that can burn. You need all those things. And so it's finding fun ways to, to introduce those into your world that feel right for your movie. You needed to find a way that took those big monster movie uh, tropes and put them in a young boy's um, universe. And so Victor is a scientist, but he's a scientist who's using what he has around. He's very much MacGyver of sort of reanimation of the dead. Um, and the other boys, they're doing what they can do uh, to, to bring things to life. But it was also important to me that the town itself be somewhat magic, right from the very start. 
uh, the new science teacher shows up and says, um, and the reason why you have a new science teacher is that the old one got killed by lightning. And lightning strikes all the time in this town of New Holland. And so there's something weird and special and magic about the town. And some of that was my, um, just being a dad. Like, I didn't want to see kids, like, trying to, like, plug their hamsters into the wall. Like, I wanted there to be something, <laughs> the town is magical. There's a reason why this is happening in this town as opposed to, you know, Denver. You know, part of the fun of the movie is that while Victor is, you know, doing the nefarious deeds to sort of bring Sparky back, we see the classic monster movies on one of the TVs. And so um, we actually have a snippet insertion of, of, of those things. Was well, that in the script? Did you it was in the that? script. Okay. It was always in the script that we would have the monster movie. It wasn't clear sort of what clip we would stick in there right. for that moment. Uh, one of the, the nice things about doing a stop motion feature is that you have a lot of time to plan ahead for every single shot. And so you have people building storyboards and very clever artists who are thinking like how to fill every frame full of great references. So even as we sort of pan through the uh, pet cemetery, every gravestone has a name on it. And there's like a, either a story or a joke that goes with it. And that's the remarkable thing about uh, these, the, the attention to detail you can pay when you're shooting one frame at a time. This was my second time writing for stop motion animation. And I remember on Corpse Bride, there were certain limitations. So sometimes they would come back to me saying like, this puppet cannot sit down. Like literally like, you know, the way that this is built, it's gonna be very hard to sit down. Um, Tim is not, doesn't get hung up on that very much. Like he'll break a puppet in half if he has to make the puppet sit down. Um, <laughs> there are things that are very difficult to do in stop motion animation. Like classically, you wouldn't want to do crowd scenes in stop motion animation because there's no extras. Like every, every person has to be moving independently. You, you could spend, you know, a lifetime building one crowd scene. So there are moments of that in, uh, in Frank and Weenie where we have some crowds and we have you know sea monkeys running around but we're judicious about that we're not sort of going crazy with that and even things that are supposed to be no-nos like you know how are we going to do that they find ways to do that so like Victor rides a bike and like you wouldn't think oh riding a bike would be easy but no it's actually really hard to ride a bike in stop motion animation and they would do that so I was always mindful that someone was going to have to do everything I, I said um, but I wouldn't let that stop me and if there was anything that needed to change I was happy to change it but um, they always found ways to do it. I had no idea who was going to be the voice cast when we started, so I didn't. I did sense that like, Tim was going to probably go for real kids as the boys, okay. and because he really doesn't, he likes that sort of the innocence of like you know, you know, kids who are actually kids. Um, but I had no idea, and so Tim just got amazing people, and that's the remarkable thing about having a career like Tim's is that he's worked with amazing people throughout his career, and he can bring them back in. So each time I would see that somebody was doing something, like yay. And uh, so when they said, like, Catherine Harris would be, it's like, that's great. Like, who's she playing? She's like, she's playing everyone. I'm like, great, <laughs> done. I know. Know what? Your dog is alive. You can't tell anyone. Promise? Promise. Victor brought an animal back to life. With lightning and boom and <sighs> Something big is going to happen. Who's responsible for this? I just want my dog back. We can do better. Bigger. Rides Colossus from your tomb. Cool. Mr. Whiskers is trying to tell us something. Did you get that out of the litter box? Oh my. I need your help. I asked him first. My problem, Bigger. Yeah, he's right.